barriers. Public perception is the very first great barrier. Everyone has been hearing decade after decade, fusion is just around the corner. Fusion is just around the corner. Another 20 years, another 30 years. That's been part of the problem. <clears throat> and by the way, it's no longer true. Uh, current energy providers need to understand that many of these new technologies, not just fusion, but many technologies, do not need to threaten their current infrastructure. On the contrary, they are a potential salvation. You don't want to have all your eggs and rocks in one basket. <clears throat> um, one thing I do want to say before I leave this slide, uh, that that reference at the bottom, the UE has been focused on long-term fusion at a very high cost, with very little evidence of payback. And by the way, that is the Tokamak project. I, I am pleased to say that uh, error of judgment was challenged and reason prevailed, and the enormous amount of money that the United States was spending on the ITER Tokamak project has been removed. This is a great thing, truly. Now, I'll get back to that in a moment, but what are the technological barriers? You have to be able to create what's called a well, a very deep, stable well that will achieve the high core density <coughs> over a reasonable volume. We need to develop grids to withstand sputtering and heat flux. And George has come a great distance with his new titanium molybdenum alloys for the uh, IEC cages. And if these issues are resolved favorably, the engineering of IEC reactors becomes very manageable. And IEC reactors can be very attractive with regard to safety, environment, and economics <clears throat> by, by means of comparison. If a tokamak would fit on most of this campus, an IEC would fit in this podium. <clears throat> uh, further development time is required uh, in the IEC technologies. Again, there are a number of commercial near-term spin-off applications, including propulsion. <clears throat> now, how long have we known about the potential of IEC fusion? A whole lot longer than you may think. In fact, there was, in the 50s, quite a competition going on between uh, Laurentiev and Farnsworth. Farnsworth in America, you may remember his name as the inventor of the television. <clears throat> there was quite a bit of competition in the 50s and uh, many important breakthroughs occurred to allow George to do his work. Now Farnsworth had a special student, and I say this to you because many people will say the history of fusion is, is somewhat checkered, and that is inaccurate. It is not the history of fusion that is checkered. It is the history of opposition to fusion that is checkered, and this is my first of many examples I'm not going to bore you with all of them, but this one is particularly unique. The picture here is Farnsworth. That's the inventor of the television. He had a laboratory in which almost all of the great American talent in fusion came out of and studied in, including a gentleman named Robert Hirsch. Uh, Robert Hirsch actually was able to develop some very significant uh, enhancements in this well, in creating this well. And he was well on the way, on the pun, to developing other aspects that were critical to making IEC work. It is a mystery to all of us, including uh, Bizarre, who has passed on, and George, who were just a handful of people in this laboratory, why Robert Hirsch made all these fantastic discoveries, moved forward the IEC technology tremendously, and then suddenly, mysteriously, didn't just turn his back on what he had discovered, but in fact, went against it and went to the DOE to develop a department that would focus on large, radioactive, cumbersome, expensive fusion instead of lightweight, small, non-radioactive fusion. Why? We don't know, and we may never know. <coughs> Unfortunately, the damage was done, and we were put on a course for several decades of barking up the wrong tree. Here's what happened. Uh, 
from about 1972 to 1985, there's a, a significant gap, uh, but some astounding uh, results were achieved by Hirsch, uh, Farnsworth, uh, many of Farnsworth's students, including Bazaar. In 1985, Bazaar revived IUC interest with the Polywell Project, which, by the way, is now driven by Rick Nebels, one of George's students. <clears throat> um, Bazaar, and again, I want, to, I want to go ahead and clarify here. Buzard worked on a kind of IEC fusion that utilized magnets. George wanted to persevere on a form of IEC fusion that would not rely on magnets. That's a key difference, because what it does is it makes a very bulky IEC. Hollywell Project was funded. Um, however, the federal government did put under a gag order Buzard not to disclose any of the results of his studies. They had offered him 50 million to develop his project that uh, somehow eroded to 6 million. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, results are not available. We hear that they're promising, but we don't know. <clears throat> In 1990, uh, Miley developed the star mode. As I said, was later used by Daimler Chrysler on their Orbel inspection lines. But he also developed a whole host of other technologies and uh, assisted in the first pulsed IEC experiments um, with uh, assistance from Kyoto. And uh, ultimately, what was discovered during this time was that IEC, unlike any of these other unusual fusion approaches, could produce a fusing plasma in a small unit, opening the route to near-term applications of fusion. Now, what are the ideal fuels for this technology? HE3 is an ideal fuel if you want your IEC to produce a lot of propulsion. When George Miley did the advanced propulsion studies at NASA, he was able to show that his bench model could achieve a propulsion at a scale of uh, such that you could take a 500 metric ton spacecraft, take <coughs> six of these engines, and you would be able to get that spacecraft to Mars in seven to eight weeks. That's on Laura. On HE3, you could get there in four to six weeks. That's propulsion. In terms of yield, however, the, the problem is this. HE3, a rare isotope of helium, is found in abundance on the moon. But it is very hard to get here. So George didn't want to wait and he figured out how to burn a commonly available fuel. If within the next six years this technology is proven, boron could become the new coal of the next century. <coughs> boron-11 is an isotope found in great abundance. Uh, for example, Vandenberg Air Force Base has huge mountains of it um, behind the facility. <coughs> By the way, before I leave HE3, uh, by way of example, all the energy needs of the United States from 2006 could have been met with an IEC fusion reactor or a set of IEC fusion reactors burning 40 tons. Some people are saying that there is over a million tons of HE3 on the moon. <clears throat> Again, the importance of Dr. Miley's research is that he has found a fuel we don't need to go to the moon for. It's right here. And just for those of you who uh, might want to geek out a little bit, I didn't put any major formulas in here, but I did want to show you the famous star mode. There are actually, you can't see it, but there are two grids in there, two sets of seven bands <coughs> of a highly, uh, uh, very dense molybdenum titanium alloy. And basically, the way an IEC works, if you, are, if you are attempting to provide the greatest yield of energy, is 